to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we are here with one of our favorite guests, Mr. Stephen Eric Bronner, uh, Board of Governors Distinguished Professor at Rutgers University, appointed political philosopher and political scientist, author of many, many books. Most recently, I'll just hold them up, The Bigot, Why Prejudice Persists, very timely book with what's going on in the world today, okay? And also, I'll hold this other book up, it's called The Bitter Taste of Hope, Ideals, Ideologies, and Interests in the Age of Obama. Let me just hold up that book. And Steve is quite a prolific writer and thinker and lecturer. He gets around. Uh, he's also on the U.S. Academics for Peace. He's an executive director of that organization. And I think when one looks around at the world today and what's going on with the situation in Korea, with Donald J. Trump as president, and all of us hoping for the best and wondering what's going to happen next, all right? Uh, this is somebody who I always like to say should be on the big shows should be on the big shows like Charlie Rose and Lawrence O'Donnell and we're so grateful that he's on our humble public access cable show uh, trying to get the word out and trying to infiltrate the media with some more substantive uh, political discourse and ideas than one normally sees although one of our recent guests um, Francis Fox Piven was actually on Lawrence O'Donnell. Yes, he was. So yeah, so I think uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, more of a need for this kind of deeper discussion than we normally see with what I call the punditry epidemic. When you watch the news now, it's like punditry. I'm allergic to punditry. Uh, I, I would get very bored if I had to be a pundit. I don't know what that is even. It's just, it's entertaining to watch. You know, you kind of, you know, it's interesting. And sometimes they make good points. I'm not saying they don't. I thought Rachel Maddow was good last night about, uh, you know, certain things, what's going on with the Trump, uh, with the uh, whole, uh, you know, thing with the... Uh, Whatever it is, there's always something, right? And there's this conspiracy, that conspiracy. I can't even keep up with all these conspiracies. The Russians, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. So why don't we start with that, Steve? Are the Russians coming? Well, what strikes me about the period right now, yes. or the, mm -hmm. the days and the weeks right now, uh, is really that there's something that comes every day. There's some, and there's something stupid that comes every day. Uh, you think of the, uh, the charge, uh, not simply of um, President Obama wiretapping uh, um, President Trump, uh, but ha using the uh, part of the British Secret Service to do it. By the way, that's a uh, an old line conspiracy uh, position. That's not something that's new. Bringing the uh, British into the conspiracy, like the Queen of England, goes back uh, to the uh, 19th century. I don't know why that's not brought out more often. That's a, that's a really, um, uh, there's, as I say, the, it, there's nothing innovative here. What I think is, is really interesting, though, is there's a reason why something's coming out every day. And one reason would be uh, to obscure what's really important. If you keep throwing stuff out every day, uh, an audience loses the ability to, say, uh, to differentiate yeah. some idiotic statement about uh, the, um, the British Secret Service yeah. and the budget uh, that's coming out, or, uh, which is going to really hurt a lot of people. Or the uh, even the way Obamacare is put forward. It's interesting that uh, Trump's general approach is he sort of puts down the obita dicta, he makes his claim, and he lets others fight it out. And this is a way to avoid uh, responsibility. This, by the way, is something dictators have always done. Oh. Yeah. Um, wow. You stand above the fray. That was the way Stalin worked. That's the way uh, Hitler worked. That's the way Mussolini worked. Mm. And 
Um, I think one of the, uh, other, the other reasons for doing this, aside from to obscure what, uh, relativize what's important as against what's um, inessential, uh, another reason to do it is that you create this sort of manic activity. This is also part of every uh, dictatorial regime, that, you, that it looks like there's constantly something going on when in fact, yeah. uh, there's very little going on. Mm. And uh, this idea that there's something going on, yeah. on the one hand, creates uh, uh, a sense of um, confusion. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, makes you look more and more to the source of the dynamic activity mm. that creates the confusion, which is Trump. Mm. It's all about him. And uh, I think what we're witnessing is uh, an American version of neo-fascism, just to put it uh, uh, straight. This is not Hitler. Uh, it's not, it's not even, uh, it's not even, it's not Mussolini. There's not yet any kind of paramilitary organization. There's, uh, there are checks and balances, which is still at least marginally intact, um, but uh, there's some really, really bad um, uh, developments, and mm. I think the way the press is being treated is actually underplayed. Mm. Mm. The pre it's fake news, so this we relativize truth. I've actually spoken elsewhere about the, mm. the, this whole idea of a post-truth society and how dangerous this is, mm. and. Um, so that would be what, that would be uh, uh, one thing. Another thing is that um, with this kind of um, this kind of argument on fake fake news, keeping reporters off, for example, uh, the Secretary of State's plane, um, uh, sort of deciding who uh, which. Uh, reporters can speak or which reporters would be admitted to press conferences and the like. This is a very, very serious uh, business because the press is the fourth estate, mm. as, it's, as it's called. It's supposed to be, um, uh, in some way, a serious check. And part of the reason it's a check, it's considered a check on power, is because it's supposed to be reasonably... Uh, fair-minded and reasonably objective mm. I say reasonably mm. and what's happened is that that uh, while uh, people like yourself or uh, mm. progressives are talking about the credibility crisis of Trump mm. the actual credibility crisis is of the press you know mm. in other words He's saying the press is, uh, mm. is uh, un not believable. The press is saying he's not believable. Mm. So what happens is, again, this kind of relativization, which is a kind of disorientation. Mm. And uh, we've been speaking about this before. And one of wow. the ways in which uh, chaos is often dealt with, this kind of chaos, we just throw everything out there. Mm. Uh, it, uh, some people call it the Reichstag solution. The Reichstag was uh, mm. the German parliament, which was set in fire and, um, uh, just before uh, Hitler uh, took power. In fact, it was the reason mm. given for Hitler assuming uh, emergency powers. And mm. um, something like that could be a war. It could be any one of a number of different things. It's interesting that uh, you have a Secretary of State that's going around Japan, uh, I'm sorry, going around Japan, going around uh, Asia and Korea, uh, Korea, and the Secretary of State is not speaking about diplomacy. He's talking about potential military retribution. And I, this is no joke, because if uh, we have to remember Trump's primary enemy during the uh, um, during the campaign was China, 
Everybody talks about uh, about Russia. Mm. Russia, I don't think, is the issue. I think China is the issue. And um, mm. and you can imagine a situation. China would be very worried about uh, uh, North Korea destabilizing yeah. um, because there would be a flood. Uh, you know, there would be a complete flood of refugees going going to China, um, and it's. Its border would be just a mess. Um, whether China is willing to permit that and have the United States uh, fleet or the, um, uh, doing maneuvers in the area or remaining in the area to do uh, in a consistent way, in a consistent, at least threatening way, that could be bad. Wow. Well, the latest scandal, I don't know if you were watching the news last night, because the up-to-the-date scandals here uh, actually involves uh, Douglas MacArthur, strangely enough, who was a general, a uh, great World War II general, who, uh, you know, uh, during the Korean War was relieved of his duty by Truman because he was suggesting that we invade China. So there's like some kind of a sex scandal now that just broke out that happened in the MacArthur room of a hotel. I don't know if you know about this. You got to catch up on the on the scandals. Uh, I don't know some some. I don't even know. I can't even. I don't know all the. It's, it's just crazy stuff. I think what you're saying is true, that they're just throwing everything at us and trying to sort out all these scandals, and uh, yeah. There's so much coming out day after day after day. There are only two possibilities here. Either this is a uh, a purposeful. A uh, policy of obfuscation. Obfuscation, that's the key word. Uh, which friend, that fr to our public. What is that? In other words, it, it uh, obfuscation uh, basically means that you uh, make it impossible to see clearly what's going on. Mm. Yeah, mm. Um, that's one possibility. Fran yeah. Piven uh, uses that term a lot. Mm. Um, and the other possibility is, and it's one that's not accepted enough or taken let me put it this way taken seriously enough which is the trump's nuts oh, yes. um right. and mm. here it's the kind of thing well we sort of laugh about it mm -hmm. uh, you know um uh, jokes are made about it especially on msnbc yeah. uh and it's almost like, oh, well, he's our loon. He's, uh, uh, you know, put uh, sort of let out of the closet. But it's sort of he's still our loon. Yeah. And on some level, uh, how should I say, the mainstream is very nervous about moving in that direction at all. And to, uh, it's understandable. But, you know, uh, this is the kind of thing... Uh, the North Korean leader is considered insane. Uh, yeah. Ahmadinejad in uh, in Iran was considered nuts. Assad is considered nuts. Mm. I mean, it's very possible we have somebody who's even more nuts. Wow, wow. It's possible. My wife likes to say that, in fact. Yeah. Well, it is, is, it is a possibility. And... Um, <clears throat> We, this show is going to air probably in a month from now. So we are now, this is March 18th, the day after St. Patrick's Day, 2017. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen between now and the time it airs, but last night we saw that Angela Merkel, who visited the United States, the German president, was giving a press conference with Trump, the chancellor, and she looked at Trump as if he were crazy. He was saying these crazy things, and she just gave him a look like, you know, I'm telling you. Uh, yeah. One can say what one wants about uh, Angela Merkel, but yeah. this, but she is uh, an incredibly shrewd and astute politician, mm. um, as shrewd and astute as it uh, as it comes as, as they come, mm. and um, what uh, it's it's not just her. Uh, the, the, the media sort of emphasizes this handshake business. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. sort of a um, an inability to appreciate what different sides to a conflict uh, mm. uh, involve. And uh, Angela Merkel at the moment uh, is involved in uh, two things. 
Uh, one is trying to preserve the European Union from a populist threat. Uh, some of uh, people like Gerd uh, Wilders in um, the Netherlands is actually direct, was directly uh, influenced by Trump. So that's on the one hand, this sort of Brexit mentality of disintegration. Uh, and then on the other hand, the Russian threat. And uh, it's almost like Europe feels, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, there's a disintegration which looms, and on the other hand, there is an imperialist power that threatens. Now, I've always been one to say that uh, that this uh, uh, Ukraine policy that's uh, carried on with, with uh, Russia simply being the bad guy is misguided. Uh, to a certain degree, uh, Trump is even, I think, right on that. Mm. But uh, if one wants to push a policy uh, of Russian disengagement or um, uh, pacification between Europe and Russia, it can't be done this way. It can't be done the way uh, Trump is doing it. On the, uh, then, too, there was also, I mean, this is really something amazing. On the one hand, so, one, um, Angela Merkel is insulted. Yeah. Two, the British are insulted. Yeah. Thirdly, uh, you'll note that uh, the scandal that broke in Ireland over the immigration uh, where uh, the Irish Prime Minister uh, mm. stated forthrightly that the uh, St. Patrick, Patrick's Day is about immigrants. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. uh, let's put it this way, the, uh, the president had very little to, uh, to say in response mm. uh, in a meaningful way. Right. By the way, the, of course, the scapegoating, the use of the scapegoat yeah. Uh, I forgot to say that before, is uh, another element of every dictatorship. Wow. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's as serious wow. an authoritarian threat as I've ever experienced in, in the United States. Steve, given the seriousness of what's going on, why do you think Obama is so quiet? It, it's like I wish he would speak out. I wish he would. Here he's being attacked, he's being called uh, a spy. Russia, Trump accuses him of wiretapping Trump Tower, and why is he being so meek? Why is he? Why is he so? Why doesn't he come out and say something? And why doesn't Hillary say something? Like, where are the leaders? Where are the liberal leaders to rise up right now? They're missing an action, except for John Lewis, when he called Trump illegitimate. Who else is actually saying something of stature? Well, you know, why are they so quiet? I don't want to give. Uh, Obama pass on uh, on this. I, I too think he should have yeah. uh, should come out more strongly. I mean, the, the obvious reason uh, he doesn't is I think because uh, this would polarize the country even further. This is something that would go against American tradition. One president uh, blasting uh, blasting another, especially under circumstances in which the um, the balance of power is so dramatically mm. tilted against uh, mm. the Democrats um, and Obama's legacy, if you want to, if you want to think about it. With Hillary, uh, it would just be taken as sour grapes, and that's I'm sure that's the way uh, uh, Trump uh, would treat it. But I agree with you. I think that um, what we need at the moment is two things. Uh, we need a kind of uh, popular front, a unity of uh, anti, shall we say, anti-fascist forces going back yes, yes. to the 30s, right. which goes two ways. It goes from the bottom up. Um, it means coming to terms with the sectarianism, which has always been uh, a part of the... Uh, of the left, and to, uh, and on the other hand, a, a timidity on the part of the liberal leadership, which is uh, not exactly taken uh, risen to the forefront. There have been people. Uh, Maxine Waters is one person. 
uh, John Lewis, you're quite, you're quite right. I mean, there are various people who've stood, who's in, in a certain way stood up. But one of the things that would prevent somebody like President Obama, or, or that mm -hmm. inhibits Obama, I'm sure, mm -hmm. is that what is it that you want him to come out against? If every day there's something, mm -hmm. he can't come out every day mm -hmm. blasting Trump on one thing or another. Because if that were to be done, in his view anyway, if that were to be done, the, uh, the country would become even more polarized than it already is. Mm -hmm. And there's a fear of that. I mean, um, you can see the authoritarian trends in uh, taking shape in, uh, in Washington. You can see it with, uh, with uh, the way the courts treat it. You can see it with the dismissal of all these people. Uh, from um, all these prosecutors, which I think also was uh, there wasn't enough uh, mm. um, publicity and, and discussion about. So now you got the Justice Department, or if you like, the uh, uh, the, the judiciary and the enforcement uh, mm. um, institutions, plus the press under attack. And on the top of that, there's still thousands of positions which haven't been filled. Wow. Again, creating chaos. One of the things that, uh, that Trump has been able to do in a weird way, mm -hmm. the uh, is mm -hmm. two things. On the one hand, separate himself from all the, um, mm -hmm. shall we say, the, uh, the midget activity. Uh, I hope I don't sound too... Uh, yeah. uh, no. Uh, what I'm thinking is people like yeah, yeah. Uh, like Ryan, um, uh, Paul Ryan, right. and McDonald, and people right. people like this who are in a certain way almost uh, I should say as disgusting right. as any other because of their pure right. opportunism. Right. Um, Trump seems to value loyalty. I understand that. The uh, these guys, the, the Republicans. Mm. You know, um, when Hitler came into power, yeah. uh, the uh, cabinet that sort of brought him in was called the Cabinet of the Barons, and it was led by um, Fritz von Papen, who was, interestingly enough, from the Catholic Center Party. In other words, he was a centrist, an authoritarian centrist, which is talking pretty close here. Um, and the basic view was, look, we, you know, we're going to have to deal with, uh, with um, Adi, as, uh, as people ironically called him, uh, but we can control him. We, you know, we, we got this. You know? uh, we can keep him under control. And I think that this was the attitude that many establishment, uh, establishment Republicans took with Trump. And this is always the mistake. A president has power. Um, what Har Harry Truman said is right. The, tr the buck stops here. Yeah. Wow. Claudia, where, where's our passport, dear? Is it in the closet? Is it still up in there? Because, I mean, it's, this is serious stuff. It's bad. This is horrible. It's really bad. Um, trying to think positive. And another thing I want to get to in this. Too short of an hour with Steve and Eric Bronner. We got to start to come up here to Fort Lee Moore, to your lovely home with your lovely wife Annie, and 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 have a kind of discourse that you rarely see on our media. Um, but I want to try to bring hope to the world because you were also a student of Ernst Bloch, who was the great utopian philosopher mm -hmm. in Tubingen, Germany. Uh, so trying to rally the forces of hope here. I know it's difficult in dark times, but I heard that um, Jerry Nash. Adler, who's a very liberal congressman, you know, from the west side of New York. He actually put a bill in the Congress that could lead to impeachment. He was the first person to move in that direction. So you also have something called the 25th Amendment, which is that if it's deemed that a president is mentally unfit, they could remove him immediately, all right? So you got impeachment and you got the 25th Amendment. What do you think about those two strategies? Well, uh, let me put it this way. I think anything that can be used, any way uh, you can throw sand into the machine, uh, is good. 
And um, Jerry Nadler has been a consistent yeah. sort of left liberal mm -hmm. uh, f uh, forever, and good for him. Yeah. Uh, whether this can, whether this is realistic, mm. uh, yeah. I I don't think so. I mean, the, both houses are controlled by Republicans, mm. so this is going to be a rather difficult um, mm. thing to push. Now, yeah. it may be that. Uh, President Trump acts so erratically, and mm. you know it just gets to the point where mm. uh, the Republican establishment can't take it anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe that would have an impact, but mm. basically, uh, it would be devastating for the for the Republican Party. I mean, just think through the implications. By the way, you you think of uh, Trump. I can tell you something that's. Um, a uh, Trump, yeah. You mentioned uh, Ernst Bloch. Yeah. Uh, Ernst, Ernst Bloch's uh, best friend was uh, in his youth was George Lukash, who was a great, oh, um, yeah, yeah, a great uh, yeah. Marxist philosopher. Actually, yeah. also in his pre-Marxist phase, he was also uh, a, a remarkable uh, mm. thinker. And he is unquestionably uh, Hungary's greatest representative mm. intellectual Lukács. of yeah of oh, the wow. uh, maybe Bella Bartok but yes, yes. in terms of sheer breadth wow. uh, Lukash is really re an amazing character yeah. and um, but he was a communist um, he sought, he even was a critical Stalinist whatever that means um, all of that's true uh, and he was Jewish mm -hmm. and his archive is now being closed by the by the government. Oh, yeah, no. and there's a statue oh. Oh. of Lukash, um, which is also being removed. Oh. This now this is oh. a, this is a matter of some interest to me because wow. Lukash influenced oh half the people who've been on your show. Yes. I mean, yes. uh, Stanley Aronowitz and. Uh, well, I don't know if Todd well, Gitlin was influenced, but yeah. Stanley Aronowitz sure. and yeah. uh, Cornell West. And I'm Bertel Ullman. I think to it. Okay, yeah. Bertel perhaps. Right. But um, there were an awful lot of critical theorists in the in the United mm. States. Uh, mm. Doug Kellner, uh, yeah. Andrew yeah. Feinberg, a whole bunch of them. And all of us were profoundly influenced by uh, history oh. and class consciousness, oh. which still still has an amazing impact upon students. Oh. And uh, the attack on Lukash is in a certain has sort of morphed yeah. into a preoccupation by yeah. a real genuine fascist movement in Hungary. Hungary. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it's probably the most uh, fascist of all the states now in, um, in, uh, in the West. Um, and the slogan is Judeo-Bolshevism. And that's the old time stuff. That's from the 20s and 30s. So he's a Jew, he's a Bolshevik, and the two fuse. And so the anti-Semitism of Jobik, that's the name of the party, and the anti-communism built in, you bring those two together, it can be a, wow. a pretty flammable combination. Wow, I'm so glad you mentioned. Oh, I wanted to say, I'm, I'm sorry, that uh, in April there is going to be an international congress. I've been, uh, yeah, okay. uh, which um, in Budapest, which uh, is going to bring in about 90 to 100 scho uh, oh. scholars and activists from different countries. Oh. And uh, yeah, I've been asked to wow. do a plenary, and I'm Terrific. very proud of that. Yeah, the two people who organized this were uh, Janusz uh, uh, Kellerman and Michael Thompson. Uh, wow, congratulations. Now, I have a different kind of Hungarian connection. My great grandfather was friends with Bela Lugosi. So that's a. T <laughs> but uh, that's coming from. Better known than Lukash. <laughs> Certainly better known than Lukash. We need Lukash to be as well known as Bela Lugosi. I think that's. Very well said. Okay. Yeah. And that goes back to my last book that I wrote, which is called A New Theory of Fame. Oh, I think the concept of fame itself has gotten out of whack, and the subtitle of that book is Toward a Humane, Ethical, Planet-Saving Concept of Celebrity and the Good Life. 
And the premise is when people like Donald Trump and Kim Kardashian are more famous than good professors and scientists and social workers and teachers who ought to be more well known, we're trying to reimagine even the concept of fame with our TV show by who we choose to feature as guests on our show. Kim Kardashian can't get on. I don't care if she begs me. She's not getting on. Right. She you'll, ain't. You'll show her. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the you know one of the reasons yeah. uh, you were able to do that, of yeah. course, is you're decoupling fame from capitalism, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, the reason that uh, this is all a marketing tool if you, at the moment, oh. and um, any sense of enduring quality, I mean, enduring influence. Uh, you know, gets lost. Everything is bang, bang, bang. Ooh. And everybody gets their 15 minutes, and um, wow. that's that. Wow. You know, I'm glad you mentioned Stanley Aronowitz uh, because he also invited me to sit in on a couple of his classes mm -hmm. a few years back, and I sat in on one of his classes on George Lukacs. Oh, okay. okay. And also I sat in on one of his classes on Herbert Marcuse and also on Eric Fromm. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of Fromm, you invited me to that wonderful conference last year on Eric Fromm, mm -hmm. which was called the, the, the Insane Society. Right. The word in was in parentheses, remembering Eric Fromm and the Frankfurt School, okay? So if we're talking about issues of sanity and craziness and crazy Trump and this and that, is this what capitalism produces? Is this the end game of capitalism itself? The consciousness of a person who goes to business school, who doesn't read philosophy, who doesn't, who is not, who's not been educated in a humanistic way where everything is cutthroat competition, doggy dog, constantly embattled. We don't use that. Term. We don't use that. Oh, not Phoebe. No, doggy. That, that, that's right. Oh, sorry, Phoebe. I didn't mean that, Phoebe. I didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> show, show Phoebe. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll show Phoebe. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, you know, this is becoming, it's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, in my, I have a series with Palgrave uh, Press, yeah, called Critical Political Theory and Radical Practice. And um, uh, Robert Smith, R.C. Smith, who's a, a really an extraordinary young man, has uh, put forward a uh, his book. It just came, literally, I just got copies, yes, hard copies yesterday, uh, on um, society and social p and pathology, mm. and how the uh, the modern capitalist society is becoming pathological, oh. and. Oh. Let me put it this way: it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a crazy position. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, mm. and you could even say that there's something about uh, Donald Trump built into this. Mm. Um, you know, capitalism is about profit. Mm. Uh, it's not about quality of life. It's not about, uh, mm. it's not about anything except making money. Yeah. It can be uh, making stupid ideas popular. It can be making intelligent ideas popular. Mm -hmm. Chances are it's going to be making stupid ideas popular. Right. You mentioned Herbert Marcuse yes. coming up with uh, the idea of the culture industry, yes. where art in, becomes a commodity. In other words, it doesn't even exist as art anymore. It's just another commodity. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can imagine a situation in which in order to maximize profit, uh, the culture industry fixates on the largest, uh, on hitting the lowest common denominator mm -hmm. for each niche. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have, uh, uh, I don't know, Marx for beginners or Freud for beginners. And in on one level, that's very nice and very good. On another level, people forget about Marx and read the Marx, Marx for beginners. And so there's a drop, actually, in what Marx called the uh, material level of culture. Mm -hmm. And without that, uh, how should I say, our ethical focus gets distorted, mm -hmm. I think, pretty badly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, for example, uh, just a simple example, the way one talks about education or one talks about health yeah. We have to be efficient, mm. right? Now, there are many things that efficiency is necessary for in a world of scarcity. Right, right, right. 
and bureaucracy is necessary for in, in a world mm -hmm, of scarcity. Mm -hmm. But there's some things which speak to public goods, mm -hmm. which you have to use a different kind of measurement for. Mm -hmm. When you think of the arts, when you think of uh, support for shows like yours, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you're not going to make anybody any money. Mm -hmm. of, uh, yeah. Well. Uh, maybe you will. Yeah. We hope you will. <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, <laughs> but chances are you won't. Okay. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't devalue the uh, devalue the the meaning of uh, the meaningfulness of your show or the work. Yeah. And um, I yeah. think that one of the things that the the next generation mm -hmm. of intellectuals really has to focus on is. Uh, this discussion of in, uh, of efficiency, and you know, Marx once the way he put it was: there's a political economy of capital, mm -hmm, which is just mm -hmm. about profit, and there's a political economy of labor, which is about public goods. You know, and we got to start talking about a political economy of public goods or of of labor, uh, mm -hmm. as against simply the political economy of capital. If you want to be radical, you got to go to the root. Wow. One of the things I'm most proud of doing in my life is back in 2002, I created an open conversation at a used bookstore in Hoboken oh, wow. where anybody could go. And it was a real social space. You could feel the sense of connection and community there. We would start talking about 7 o'clock in the evening. You know, we would bring healthy food and we would just go around the circle and people would share their concerns and ideas. And I was a moderator and I always tried to shepherd it on a little more of a cultural, political, if things got too off the rails, but sometimes they do when you have community, it's messy. But the main thing is it lasted. It lasted for a year and a half that I facilitated that. And you notice that people became friends. Uh, two marriages came out of that, uh, uh, that, that project where they actually, I hope they're still together. They're going to get mad at me. Uh, but it would actually have the weddings in the bookstore. And this also ties into that idea that uh, things that are not m monetizable, that's, you know, the more ephemeral, the, the in-between. Hannah Arendt talked about the sense yeah. of in-between, the community. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, often there's an emphasis on, well, you have to be practical, yeah, right? Yeah, so we need yeah. the numbers and right. so on. You know, if workers were totally practical, mm -hmm. they wouldn't do anything. <laughs> or they would do e exactly what the contract stipulates that they do. Mm -hmm. What that would mean for a college professor, like at, at, at Rutgers, he wouldn't pick up any graduate students. There's absolutely nothing that comes out of this materially of any interest. Mm -hmm. You would cut short your office hours you wouldn't write any letters of recommendation. Uh, you wouldn't stay after class talking to students or so on. I mean, you just let all that go. And you'd publish a few articles in journals that nobody reads, and that would be the end of it. Uh, the, the entire university would break down. Same thing with secretaries, if you think it through, or janitors, or uh, what have you. No, it's almost as if, well... From the standpoint of extracting profit, we have to be as efficient and clear and hard-headed as possible. But from the standpoint of workers, well, you know, we expect you to, uh, you know, care about you, about your uh, what you're doing. Uh, this goes back to an argument that we've been discussing since the beginning of our show, uh, which is uh, the fact that our educational system itself is becoming corporatized. And, for example, the business major was never popular until the past 30 years, I would say. People never actually went to college and studied business. It's become a more recent phenomenon. Even people who went into business years ago, they had a solid liberal arts background. So now, the, kind of, the people who are going into the voting booth and making decisions about about who to, who to vote for, who to elect as president, wh where is their critical thinking capacity if they haven't had a, a rich education where they can think outside the box, where they can know when they're being lied to? You know, you get that from a, a, a rich, critical, liberal arts education where you actually learn how to think. So I know that thinking is under threat because colleges where I've taught in are now not very they're not inimical to the kind of teaching that I do, which is very progressive. Now, I'm sure that there are left-leaning and more radical universities out there, maybe UC Berkeley or Brandeis, you know, but, but the places that I've taught, when I try to explain this to my chair, they don't get this. 
they're all corporatized now. The chair is a corporatized now. It's you have and, and Fran Fran Piven was got into a very interesting discourse about this last Saturday when we had her on the show about how in colleges they're now now you have an army of administrators. It's a whole thing where the professors are taking orders from the corporatocracy and that's how it is and that's why we created this show Steve this is really a university people watching us okay you can get a real critical education listening watching people like Stephen Eric Bronner the guests that we have on the topics that we cover and then you could go read some of his books you know it's it's time we obviously we do need better universities we might have to scrap this, you know, or, or go back to an, an earlier model when you had a Tubingen or something, or keep, keep something. But what, what's happening in academia? What's, why is the, is the educational system dumbing us down? You know, part of this is, again, that what you were talking about before, you know, there's a certain insanity in, mm. the, in, in, the, in the system. Yeah. I mean, the... F you know, you go to uh, Trenton, mm. and as a member of Rutgers, mm. people think you don't do anything. You don't do any work. Mm. You're basically just parasitical. Mm. And um, it, it, it's not even... I mean, of course, we don't like it in the universities, mm. but imagine these poor people in the who are teaching in high schools mm. and below. Mm. I mean, they're teaching five, seven classes. Horrible, these are these are heroes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, high school teachers and uh, yeah. and uh, the like. And I think there's been a, a twofold um, a twofold development. Yeah. One was a mistake, I think, a serious mistake on the part of the left yeah. in the, in the '60s, which was the idea that everyone has to go to college and uh, basically study liberal arts. Uh, there's no reason for that. If they want to, that's, an, that's something else. Um, what we've seen is that uh, apprenticeship programs, um, and you can think of dozens and dozens of things. New York was, was uh, uh, inundated with these different uh, schools, Aviation High School and uh, Brooklyn Tech and uh, schools like this. Uh, but there were, you know, many, many, many of them, and in terms of high schools, and in co uh, I think one of the moves in college that has to be made is to begin to allow people to learn crafts and to learn um, to learn skills. This is it's really an important uh, important thing. The danger, of course, is that what they learn will be taken over and rendered irrelevant by technology. What that means is money has to be spent to expand the quality of uh of this kind of apprenticeship program and the skills that are taught yeah. you know it can't simply be any uh i mean tubing in and the uh you know one has this image of the 19th century university yeah. i mean one of the sources the of, of academe yeah. Well, in, in in America, it sort of has a nice yeah. quality. In uh, Germany, it's not so nice. I mean, uh, there uh, was uh, the, the model. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Humboldt's uh, yeah Humboldt's uh, model, but the uh, fraternities, for example, oh. that was a real source of fascist thinking oh. and racism. Oh. Yeah, called the Burschenschaften, um, and. Uh, it, you know, the, it, this was really meant for an elite, mm. a, a, a tiny yeah. elite, right. and that was the same thing in in, uh, in France and uh, Hungary, elsewhere. Yeah. And of course, if you have an elite, yeah. you can um, make demands that yeah. you obviously can't make if you have more and more students in your classes, right? right? Um, and in some way, the only the only way I think to deal with this is not to get rid of the idea of the mass university, but to expand it. Mm. And expanding it uh, means investing in it. And that doesn't mean setting up online courses. Mm. I mean, that is, mm. for the stuff you're talking about, yeah. uh, civic culture and the like, yeah. this is just a catastrophe. Uh, uh, and... Wow. Every, everybody I know who teaches it knows that.
Wow. And also, like, all right, so obviously there's a crisis in our politics, and you being a political scientist, would it make sense for us to have some kind of political education being promulgated, like the kind that Richard Dreyfus is advocating, to have civics clubs, you know, in school, outside in the community, where you could just have these discussions and share ideas? I don't think the problem is apathy. I, 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 I think uh, this is misguided. People are involved in tons of different things. Uh, at Rutgers, um, my students there are members of clubs, they're members of soup kitchens. They do all, ki all kinds of imaginable activities. It's really impressive, even while they work, even while having jobs. Uh, the, the question is, how do you make this uh, hip? Yes, sexy. Uh, not just hip, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, this is work. It's a, it's after it's after our stuff. There's a seriousness involved in these clubs. Mm -hmm. If it's if they're yeah. supposed to be, uh, if they're supposed to be uh, mm -hmm. produce uh, uh, heightened consciousness, and um, that's tough to do. But sure, I think that you, what you want to do is expand the education out of the mm -hmm. classroom. Yeah. And to me, the, the image is not the club, okay. it's the cafe. Ah, That's what you want to push. The cafe culture. Yeah. yeah. But in a new form. Okay. And maybe Facebook and things like that are helping produce that. Yeah. Let's try to nurture that possibility now in the world because one of the problems in cafe culture is that the business culture has infiltrated there too. Like I'll go to cafes and I'm surrounded by, we call them laptop jockeys, <laughs> you know, on the laptops. And the conversations are all about business. You know, no one's talking philosophy. Nobody's talking about poetry and, and art and, and cinema. Where they, you can't have that image of the, of the philosophical cafe of Sartre. You know, is that something that could be resurrected? You know, when I was, uh, when I came back to, uh, New, especially uh, after I got back to New York from Berkeley in the 70s, mm. uh, the Cafe Dante was a meeting place in uh, Greenwich Village. Yeah. And uh, people like Stanley and uh, uh, a whole group of, uh, of Europeans, uh, yeah. th this would be a changing, uh, <laughs> a changing group, Gene Cohn, Andrew Arado, a whole yeah. group of different people mm -hmm. would sort of come and go. Uh, some were sort of itinerant radicals, some were uh, <laughs> writers, some and so on. But it was every Friday uh, we would meet. Uh, oh. Oh. In fact, the term for us uh, was the... Uh, uh, ironically in German was the Luftmenschen, which means uh, the people who live in the clouds. Uh, it, it, was re it, was, it was great. Uh, you learned about new books, you learned about, it was really terrific. Uh, I mean, but that's now 40, 50 years, 40 years ago. Uh, I think the, uh, what's important, if you're going to talk about new uh, uh, cultural forms of interaction, you got to get y younger kids on the show. Okay. Uh, 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 yes. uh, both uh, both uh, Richard Dreyfus and I are too old. Oh, if, come on. Not you for guys this. You're very um, young at heart. You're youthful. Uh, you're vibrant. Well, that's of course true, but uh, well, I think. You're together with Richard Dreyfus. Uh, two of you uh, together. Be fine. Yes. Uh, but the, the point is, uh, even uh, Fran and yeah. uh, and Stan uh, Fran Piven and Stanley and Ronowitz, uh, this is a different generation. It's a different generation today. The music is different. The uh, the uh, uh, the books that are read are different. It's it's a, it's a new world, mm. and uh, if these kind of clubs and this kind of citizenship is supposed to be um, hip or yeah. uh, meaningful or exciting to young people, you got to find out what young people actually want to see in this and what their ideas are in bringing it together. Go to a Noam Chomsky lecture and you will see young people, you That's will see true. people of all ages, and I'm going to say something right now. Cornell West. Cornell West as and well. Cornell West, all right? So they do get the word out, so it's, it, it's possible to mobilize and get people excited. Now, now Noam Chomsky is going to be in New York with Wally Shawn, oh, wow. and they're going to be in a dialogue at the New York Public Library. 
These are two people who I love and admire. They work tremendously. You know, Wally Shawn, My Dinner with Andre, that wonderful movie, and and Fever. I don't know if that's if that's is uh, if that's known by uh, your audience. This might be the single most radical thing I've ever seen on uh, on a TV. I couldn't believe it. It was. It started out as a play by Wally Shawn, okay. and then was turned into a movie with uh, Vanessa Redgrave, and it was uh, directed by her son. Aww. And this was so clever, and so, I mean, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not yes. going to. Uh, right. I don't want to ruin it for your uh, uh, for your audience. But the fever is what happens when a. Uh, an intelligent liberal person learns how bad things are outside and about the, the, uh, the experience of imperialism and so on. And the fever grips them. And it's really, it's a remarkable, uh, a remarkable piece. You know, one of my favorite scenes in Capitalism, A Love Story, the documentary with Michael Moore, in the beginning of the movie, he's hanging out with Wally Shawn, and he just like bumps into him in a store, and they're talking, and it's very off the cuff, and you could see that they're friends. There's something very humane about about Wally Shawn, and, and about, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Michael Moore, too. And, uh, with Noam Chomsky, I think one of the most interesting things about Chomsky, which is really remarked on, is... He reached people through his uh, writings. Yes. Uh, this was not a media phenomenon. I mean, I think Cornell West would say himself that right. what helped him so much was being on TV and so on. Uh, not to in any way denigrate him, it's just, I think, uh, true. Uh, but with Chomsky, it's something special. And uh, you'll see, Noam Chomsky, if I can say so, is not a great speaker. Yeah. Um, oh. And uh, um, he's uh, he had a, a cleft palate. It made it difficult uh, yeah, for him. Yeah. But uh, he's not a great speaker. But he's a brilliant intellectual. And mm. I think what captures the spirit mm. for young people is how honest he is and how co uh, how consistent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a man of tremendous integrity, yeah. even when he's wrong. It's. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's you know this is goodwill, and you know also that there's an ongoing willingness to engage in a discourse, yeah. which is really remarkable. If I had to pick an Enlightenment intellectual today, oh. uh, which is something that's dear to my heart, the Enlightenment, yes. it would be Noam Chomsky. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're almost at the end of our hour. It went by so quickly. Uh, we actually have six minutes left, which is... Good. Um, let's uh, just, again, remind people of uh, Steve's uh, most recent books, uh, which are The Bigot, Why Prejudice Persists. Let's get a close-up on that. Okay, Claudia? Um, and the other book is The Bitter Taste of Hope, Ideas, Ideologies, and Interests in the Age of Obama. All right? And uh, those are two recent books, and uh, as we start to wrap up, maybe you could just also think about hope and going forward. And you remember that big protest march that they had the day after Trump's inaugural? I think it was, in numbers-wise, tell me if I'm wrong, the biggest protest in the history of the world. What is that? Why is it so quiet now? Why can't? What's? Are they waiting for something to happen, or what? Well, you know, uh, you can only do these protests and these mass demonstrations. Uh, you can't do those every day. And on top of that, the, the United States in particular is different from France uh, and different from Germany, and even different from England. We don't have parties which are mobilizing masses of people. We need parties then. That could be a help. Uh, well, that's, uh, that is what you were talking about before with uh, President Obama and uh, people like Hillary Clinton calling on people to go into the streets. Um, yeah. I mean, the really brave move on, uh, on some of this would be even to speak about a new forms of civil disobedience, mm. Gandhi style, yeah. uh, or Martin Luther King style. Uh, but this is uh, this is a step, and I think there's some growing that needs to be done wow. on our part. But yeah. at the same time, I don't think you can deny that 
uh, more people are interested in politics today, if you want to talk about hope. Yes. Uh, Democratic Socialists of America, I think it grew by 10,000 members or something wow. like Some enormous uh, number. I could be wrong, wow. but I, 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 th I think that's true. And it's clear that the, uh, the ratings for uh, uh, MSNBC have gone up. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. So people are interested and they're ready. What I think, uh, what I think is that the establishment, if we're going to move forward, the problem isn't with the apathy. The problem isn't with with everyday people. It's with the elites moving to the left, and that's media elites and political elites among the liberals. I I really I think the liberals are very much to blame. If there's uh, too moderate, too centrist. Yeah, yeah. It, it's time to to say I think what every ponies about them. It's time to say what everybody knows, okay. which is dealing with Donald Trump and his friends. This is not an intellectual discourse. Oh, no. I think if I can, I know this sounds terrible, but I think it's true. I think what we're talking about here is intellectual thuggery, but nothing else. And we have to, and they have to be treated that way. So I'm actually looking at the donuts on the table there, and I'm, I can't wait until we can continue this wonderful conversation, which is a very humane space to be uh, in the wonderful living room of Steve and Annie Bronner in Fort Lee. And um, just a thought occurred to me recently, if we were going to have a third party, what would the name be? What about the Humanity Party? How about we forget about the third party? We do what uh, what Bernie Sanders, who is uh, who I also think has to come out stronger and more publicly than he has. Come on, Bernie. Uh, but I think his strategy was exactly the right strategy, which is that uh, an old strategy that goes back to Michael Harrington and the Democratic Socialists of America, which is organize within the Democratic Party and push it to the left. Act as the gadfly, as the conscience, uh, and move them on the, uh, on the left. The third party routine, yeah, I mean, give it up. Okay. Uh, this has gone nowhere, and all it's done is fragment people. Mm. Um, the victory of uh, Donald Trump mm -hmm. in three or four different states could have been avoided had yeah. Uh, people from the Green Party um, mm -hmm. uh, voted for uh, voted for uh, for Hillary mm -hmm. rather than for uh, rather than sat out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an appalling situation, and this is no time for sectarianism. Sect the extent to which sectarianism flourishes is the extent to which authoritarianism flourishes. Wow! Wow! You hear that, Phoebe? No time for sectarianism. With Phoebe at the feet of the professor here, hanging out, having a wonderful, rich, intellectual discussion. We have our marching orders to organize, 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 and transform the Democratic Party. It's always such a joy to be with you and Annie here, Steve. So thank you so much, and uh, stay in the green room at all times. We may need you back soon. Anytime. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good yeah, very good. <laughs> good not word. like not like Angela not Merkel like Angela or Trump. Trump right, right? Exactly. Right. That's Here how you are. do it. That's how you do it. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank <laughs> you.